This is He Who Moans, Doctor Who Reviews. I only complain because I like Doctor Who and I care. And I overanalyze too much because... There, whatever, it's just my opinion. Series 2 of the EDAs was a bit different from Series 1. It's even more chirpy and upbeat in tone, and was a much further departure from the style of the first era than Series 1 was, and lots of its ideas are even cornier, and it felt to me like they were starting to become a bit more aware of how they should be moulding their writing for airplay that they were getting on Radio 7, and the attention gained off the back of New Who. I didn't have much of a problem with them moving further away from the style of the first era than they did last time. As much as you'd think I would whine about it and start pining, given how much of a fanboy I was for their earlier stuff, ultimately Series 2 was the culmination of the 8th Doctor Adventure's progression from Gary Russell's mind-boggling over-ambition to accessible and palatable for a wider audience, and I do see the thinking behind it. And I would recommend buying the subscription package if you're still on board from last time and haven't declared bankruptcy yet. We kick off with Dead London, and I kind of have really mixed feelings about it. Part of me loves it just as much as usual, part of me feels that it's a bit of a missed opportunity. Basically, the Doctor and Lucy arrive in some kind of London that's split into loads of different periods of history, Roman, Victorian, modern day, and the complex of different Londons is being stalked by a killer alien reptile thing. Because, of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? It's a fucking Doctor Who story. Weird thing about my opinion of Dead London is that if I were writing this, I would have removed quite a lot of the plot, which you may not be expecting from me specifically, since most of my videos basically consist of me screaming the word plot in writers' directions, but no, based on that opening hook, I would have primarily made this one just sort of be about the people of varying time periods London just sort of interacting with each other, and the Doctor and Lucy just sort of trying to figure out what the fuck's happened to cause fragmented time periods London. Because it's a really great little imaginative Doctor Who-y type premise that, if done differently, I'd be giving higher praise for. I do really like the premise, and the first half of it is what I just said, the Doctor and Lucy exploring various time periods of London that do interact with each other and trying to figure out what caused it. But when the plot itself comes into it, which explains fragmented London, I just felt that it started to reach some kind of new peak in unremarkableness. Okay, side note before I continue, Microsoft Word is now telling me that unremarkableness is not a real word. Am I the only one who seriously thinks it fucking well should be? I demand a violent protest at the headquarters of the Oxford English Dictionary. Unremarkableness should be a real word. Sorry, getting distracted. I don't want to be too harsh, but just to me, the plot itself caused it to play out in a way that made it seem all too conventional, when, if you think about it, there is a lot more to it than another set of aliens with voice changers. I just think it's the type of idea that would have really benefited from playing more on silence and stillness and baiting the listener into its mystery, like what a story that we've got in a couple of releases time did. I mean, it's called Dead London, and the resulting story I just felt was a bit too... alive, if that makes sense. Yes, it does make sense. Shut up. As said, though, decent for what it is. Next up, we got Max Warp, and... Uh, I'm not going to make any friends here, because it's one of those stories that seems to be pretty popular that just didn't click with me at all. Yeah, my opinion's similar to my view on most of Mark Gatiss' Doctor Who work. I do want to like it. I'm a big fan of Graham Garden, who guest stars, and it's penned by a favourite Big Finish writer of mine, Jonathan Morris. Anyway, it's a parody of the Clarkson-led iteration of Top Gear, which makes it ever so slightly dated based on recent events. The Doctor and Lucy show up on the set of a space motoring show called Max Warp, which features a slightly altered version of the Top Gear theme, hosted by a guy called Jeffrey Vantage, who hates political correctness. And the plot involves his co-presenter, Timbo the Ferret, getting killed in a spaceship crash. Dom, could you make it a bit less subtle, please? I don't think I really get it. And from there we head into a traditional Agatha Christie-ish approach to a murder mystery plot, but in space of course. While yes, I did find Max Warp entertaining, I do always find the EDAs entertaining, even when I'm kind of meh on them, but 
I don't really know what it was that made me feel so lukewarm on this one, because no, I didn't mind it being a bit heavy-handed, and it's not just simple reference comedy like I'm making it sound. There is more than that in there. I don't know, maybe you need to be more aware of Top Gear to appreciate it. I mean, Top Gear is one of those Marmite shows that people either actively love or vehemently don't, and I've successfully wandered through life never having seen a complete single episode. Not consciously, I've just never been interested. Maybe part of my feelings at this point of the series was I was comparing them in my head to the opening two-part epic that we had kicking off last series, and with these two, they were kind of making the opening statement that they were moving the EDAs into the more light and fluffy end of Doctor Who. Not to say that the light and fluffy end of Doctor Who is inherently a bad thing. I do go for some of the lighter and fluffier end of it sometimes, but these two just felt like the weaker starting point to me by comparison. But the next release was so good that it made my impatience totally shut up. Brave New Town is next, and it's one of my favourite EDAs along with Human Resources and To The Death, and I was surprised to find that, like with Timeworks, it's largely underappreciated. Basically, the Doctor and Lucy arrive in a town that's been reliving the same day in 1991 over and over again, and no one seems to have noticed yet. Everything I Do by Brian Adams has literally been number one forever. And for some stupid reason, no one in the town seems to have been driven insane by that fact and started a fucking riot, like what probably would happen. Yeah, we're clearly not in realism territory. Also, the sea has disappeared, and the Doctor and Lucy need to uncover what's going on before some beings referred to as the Visitors return. To talk about what makes Brave New Town so awesome requires obvious spoiler warnings plastered everywhere, because as you can probably tell, it's one of those stories that has a premise highly reliant on, ooh, it's a mystery. So skip about a minute if you want to avoid them. This one's well worth going into without knowing anything about it. There we go, opportunity lost. Okay, basically this one takes the Autons and goes a lot more introspective on them than you'd expect. While I'm sure pitching this idea to my core audience of hardline old Who fans sounds blasphemous in theory to anyone who staunchly defends canon from change, as we'd never exactly seen the Autons with much in the way of personality of their own before, but the autonomous Autons work so damn well that I'm honestly surprised this is the only big finish play they've ever appeared in. Overall, it's one of those stories with a highly enticing setup with a follow through that I actually found really satisfying. Which is a nice surprise when it comes to sci fi mysteries with an interesting opening hook that makes you go, Ooh, what's this? Yeah, no complaints on my end. Superb from start to finish. Next up, we got Skull of Sobek, and it is. a dud from Mark Platt. I know, weird, right? Well, most people will tell you that Skull of Sobek is a complete dud. I sort of disagree, because you can't exactly call a story about humanoid crocodiles invading a space monastery boring. Yeah, if you say that out loud, it sounds like a fun prospect. I appreciate it for similar reasons that I liked Minuet in Hell. Stupid, highly flawed, and you could easily call it crap and I wouldn't argue, but stupid ideas can be at least entertaining to me in and of themselves, and Skull of Sobek kind of has that element to it. However, I don't think it's a hill that anyone would die defending, and unlike my nostalgic guilty pleasure... Uh, sorry, Mr. Platt, please forgive me. Sobek's just not really got much else going on that we'd call unique and a must-listen when you set it against Doctor Who's usual sets of formulas. It's kind of a rearrangement of very familiar elements, if anything. It's a Platt by numbers, if you will. Come on. Wow, tough crowd. Once you've got the weird and stupid B-movie premise out there with its cheese factor of about 5,000, the novelty does start wearing thin pretty quickly. It started well enough, but it sort of trails off around the 15 minute mark, and the rest of the runtime basically now appears in my head as a load of fuzzy static. It's not awful, it wasn't exactly abrasive to listen to at any point. I guess the only real problem that I had with Sobek was, I know what Platt's capable of. Next up is Grand Theft Cosmos, and we're in 19th century Sweden where the headhunter shows up with Karen from Human Resources, who are competing with Lucy and the Doctor to steal a priceless artwork from a gallery made by an artist lost to history whose works made people go insane. Describing this one as basically the Doctor Who equivalent of Grand Theft Auto is fairly appropriate as I felt the plot played out in a very video gamey kind of way which is a sentiment that's evolved to become an insult among lots of mainstream critics, but somehow, this one does have the structure of a video game, but it manages to make you feel like you're involved with it. 
The dialogue in this one is just so warm and friendly and inviting and genuinely funny that even boring miserable fucks like myself would probably have a hard time arguing against it. It's not deep or anything, it's pulp and it knows it, but it was just so much fun that I found the runtime just flew by and felt like five minutes. My only real criticism that I had by the credits was just that I didn't want it to end. Which I do know is weird coming from me, because this is the closest that Big Finish have ever gone to Russell's style of Doctor Who, and Grand Theft Cosmos is the one that I would say would have worked incredibly well on television during the Russell era. But, importantly in my case, there's no Russell tropes in there, and one of my favourite Doctors on top of that. It's basically Russell's Who for irritable bastards like myself who complained a lot about Russell's Who, so I found it was ideal really. When it comes to the headhunter and Karen's involvement, what I like about the way that Big Finish have crafted their series here is, while long-running elements of a series can kind of daunt the story at hand, which usually happens all over the place in every iteration of Doctor Who, but here, Eddie Robson's used long-running elements to enhance the story at hand. While the context of the headhunter and Karen from Human Resources is nice to have, it doesn't drive focus away from the story that they're currently telling. Their history with the Doctor and Lucy works to enhance it without distracting us from what's right in front of our faces. It's very tight, very focused, and a highly creative 50 minutes. The Zygon Who Fell to Earth is next up, and it's one of the most popular EDAs, and Big Finish is first to feature the Zygons. Its plot uses a traditional alien adapts to modern society tale, a la Walter Tevis' sci-fi classic The Man Who Fell to Earth, as a framework to build on the story that we started on with Lucy's Auntie Pat at the beginning of the last series, in order to smash you over the head with some really fucking heavy dramatic turns. Basically, the Doctor and Lucy show up in a hotel in the 70s where her Auntie Pat works with her husband, where some old friends of her husband show up to try and coax him back into his old recording career. You're probably wondering why Zygons fit into that equation. Well, I'm not going to bloody tell you. Go buy it, you cheapskates. Involving Lucy's Auntie Pat directly with the plot was a really nice touch. Having the companion be highly emotionally invested in what's going on made it all the more poignant, especially with how much I'd grown to like Lucy by this point. As said, yes, Pat is primarily there with her big neon sign, as she always was, but the ending is just so effective. The Zygon Who Fell to Earth is a really powerful little story. It builds the right amount of emotional focus, and then starts delivering fucking anvils on your face for the last 20 minutes. It's a really well-structured blend of genuinely funny comedic moments and utterly brutal drama. Next up is Sisters of the Flame, and it's the first of a two-part finale, and it's one of those instances where I think that part one is so much more noticeably interesting than part two. Basically, the Doctor's vanished, and Lucy's investigating the Doctor's disappearance with the help of a giant talking centipede who is a galactic policeman. Okay, is there anyone watching this who seriously doesn't think that that's one of the fucking best ideas ever? Really, it almost made me faint with astonishment at how much I love the shit out of Rosto. While yes, Skull of Sobek tried a similar thing with its talking crocodiles, but the crocodiles to me felt like caricatures of traditional Doctor Who villains with voice changes, whereas Rosto turns out to be a highly likeable character with an interesting backstory, as well as being a fucking talking centipede policeman. Just a note to Nick Briggs if he's watching, which, you know, could happen. How about a spin-off series about your 10 foot tall centipede who's a galactic policeman? Maybe it's an animated series? Come on, we should go to CBBC and see if we can convince them to do that, because who wouldn't watch the shit out of a cartoon sci-fi detective show about a giant talking centipede? And if you're saying you wouldn't, have you got something fucking wrong with you? Hell, how's about this? Rosto the centipede galactic policeman and Frobisher the shape-shifting penguin team up to solve crimes across the galaxy. Nope, I don't see anything wrong with that idea at all. Come on, this needs doing. What I also love about it is how the premise is so completely fucking ludicrous, and yet it's played with an utterly straight face. But it's played so straight-faced to the point where it becomes funny. It's not going, ooh, a galactic centipede policeman, aren't we quirky? No, it's not heavy-handed. It's a very controlled space cop drama that happens to have a centipede in it. It never once overstepped the boundary that it delicately treads between corny and overcorn. Yeah, it turns out you can plot corniness on a graph. I was surprised too. 
Vengeance of Morbius follows it up, concluding the second series, and as you can probably tell is the second Let's Revive a Fourth Doctor Era monster story of the series, Return of Morbius, and it's nowhere near as strong as part one, and I'm also one of many listeners who was really disappointed to find that Rosto played such a small role in it, given how fucking awesome he'd been in Sisters of the Flame. It is decent enough, but it basically replaced Brain of Morbius' morbid sense of humour with elements of a New Who finale. Brain of Morbius is one of those stories that I don't think gets nearly enough love it deserves. Most people talk up ones like Genesis of the Daleks, for obvious reasons yes, but Brain of Morbius is just so dark, violent, funny in a very twisted way, that and Morbius himself is furry and has a weird thing on his head, which is cool. Yes, I am a grown-up critic. Shut up. But in Vengeance of Morbius, we're pretty much following the exact same formulas as Russell's New Who finales. The universe slash Earth is in danger of classic Doctor Who monster, and I just felt ever so slightly put out by that. I kind of like the bits where, as they try and stop Morbius from rising again and conquering everything, we then get to see a future where Morbius actually has conquered the universe. That was pretty cool. As a whole, it does work well enough, yes, and my being kind of lukewarm on it probably was part of me comparing it in my head to Brain of Morbius's gothic trad monster movie mashup. That and there was also the pining for Rosto going on. Yeah, this one had really big shoes to fill, and it didn't quite manage it. The ending's really good though, it ends on a cliffhanger which has the all important tons at stake aspect to it. Regular viewers will know that I have a tendency to bitch at New Who when it ends its series on a cliffhanger, leaving us with months waiting until it gets resolved, a la River is Amy's Baby, primarily because by about eight months later when the show starts again, I've completely forgotten about it and stopped caring. But I will accept and buy into ending a run of stories on a cliffhanger, if the cliffhanger is massive, potentially show-altering, and leaves me going, how on earth are they going to write their way out of that one? That is what an end-of-series cliffhanger needs, not just making me go, oh, okay, wonder what's going to happen next. The end of Vengeance of Morbius did get me on the edge of my seat, wondering how the show was going to continue after that. I mean, yeah, I knew that they were going to write their way around it, but when you're ending your series on a cliffhanger, that's one of those instances where being a fucking drama queen about it is a necessity. Where I want the episode to be fucking screaming at me going, Oh my god, how the fuck are we going to write our way around this one? And this one did have that, so, you know, that is something in spite of how I was kind of meh on the bulk of the runtime, credit where it's due, really solid ending. 